I'm going to tell a story within a story, within a story, within a story, within a story, within a story. I was 12 years old, and when she asked me the question, I looked up. She said, Steve, what do you want to paint? I looked across the room, and I saw two canvases, both 24 by 36 inches. When I saw those canvases, I thought to myself, this is my chance to be an artist because, well, real artists, they paint on canvas. Now, even at the age of 12, I was quite accomplished at drawing. And I was quite accomplished at drawing because my grandfather himself was an artist. My grandfather became an artist in an ordinary but roundabout way. My grandparents are deaf. And for that reason, my grandfather, when he was younger, did not receive an education that he would have received otherwise. But a man whom he worked for as a custodian saw how tremendously accomplished he was at rendering and sent my grandfather back to school at the Kansas City Art Institute. To this day, my mom reminds me, Steve, don't forget, your grandfather had Thomas Hart Benton for a teacher. Because my grandparents were deaf, I stayed three or four days a week with them at their house. It made going to the store easier for my grandmother. When I stayed at my grandparents, I, of course, did what my grandfather did, and that is paint and draw. So that even by the age of 12, my friends would ask me to draw pictures of them and pictures of their favorite things. When she asked me what I wanted to paint, I knew that those were expensive materials. I had never been allowed to paint with canvas and oil paint before because they were so expensive. My grandfather couldn't afford to let me do that. I asked her if I could run home. I ran across the street to our house. I made my way up to the second floor, back to my room. I reached underneath my bed and I pulled out a metal white lunchbox with a Hot Wheels emblem flashing across the front. From the upper left-hand corner of one of the 16 compartments, I pulled my Demon Hot Wheel. Now, what you have to know is that previous Wednesday, I had called down to Gateway Sporting Goods on the plaza with a particular request. The woman answered the phone, and I said, Ma'am, I said, do you have any new Hot Wheels in the store this week? She set the phone down on a glass case. She came back in about a minute, and she said, Well, we've got one new car in this week. And I said, Which car is it? And she was reading from a list, I could tell. She said, we've got a demon Hot Wheel. And when she said the word demon, I could picture that car. <laughs> that car was one of eight cars lined up side by side on the back of my Hot Wheels track. Its name underneath, next to the Python, next to the Silhouette, all those cars. I had every one except for the demon Hot Wheel. The demon Hot Wheel. It was actually the car that was pictured on the front of my Hot Wheel track, jumping through the air from one red ramp to the other. When she said demon Hot Wheel, I knew that all the kids in California right then were playing with that car, but I might not ever have that chance because at that time, toys weren't distributed evenly across the United States. I ran in the kitchen. I said, Mom, I said, they've got a demon Hot Wheel. Can I go to Gateway? She said, Steve, wait till Saturday. I said, but Mom, please, if I don't go now, somebody's going to buy that car. This is my only chance. Please. She said, go. Gateway closes at 530. I went down to Gateway, and I purchased that demon Hot Wheel. And when I got it out of the store, I took it out of the box, and I held it up in the same position that it was pictured on my Hot Wheel track. You could see a little bit underneath, and you could see the profile. The only thing that bothered me about that Demon Hot Wheel was that it was burgundy, a color that I was not particularly taken with, a color that I have been faded with out of trying to buy things that are inexpensive. It actually became the color of my truck. It became the color of the bicycle that I've ridden a couple of times from Alaska. I wanted it to be day glow orange, my favorite color. <laughs> As I walked and held that car up, playing with it in my head, 
I pictured it day glow orange. And then I remembered all the mistakes I had made painting Hot Wheels before. I'd get a little bit of paint on the windshield. I'd make a mistake. I'd try to take it off with turpentine. I'd melt the windshield. <laughs> no, I wasn't going to make that mistake with possibly my only demon Hot Wheel. When she asked me what I wanted to paint, I knew what I wanted to paint. It was an image that was demanding. It was an image that I wanted to accomplish. That day, I painted my demon Hot Wheel day glow orange jumping through the air against a bright blue sky. I hung the painting to dry in my room on a white brick chimney. And because it was oil paint, it had to dry for a while. Underneath that painting on the floor, I played intently with my demon Hot Wheel. I'd get so close to it down on the floor that I could block off the view of everything else in the room and I could picture myself in that car like I was driving. Later in that summer, two new Hot Wheels were issued, replicas of Don the Snake Prudahome and Tom the Mongoose McEwen's funny cars. When I got those two Hot Wheels, I would pretend like my demon Hot Wheel was a kind of family car. I would drive the demon Hot Wheel to the drag strip, I'd climb out, I'd get in Don Prudahome's car, and I'd shoot down that drag strip 250 miles an hour, flames shooting out the headers. <laughs> I could picture in my head that image. Some years later, August 1994, I'm in Prairie Lights Bookstore with my wife who teaches seventh grade earth science. She's looking for books on volcanoes, and I'm reading books on bicycles. I come across an image in a photograph of a man with his bicycle in what looks like horribly extreme conditions. And I read the caption. The caption says, 25 below zero, the Iditarod Trail, Alaska. Already half the participants have been pulled out of the race with hypothermia. Billed as the world's toughest human-powered ultramarathon, the Iditarod bike takes place each February in the Alaskan bush. It was an image that was demanding. It was an image that I wanted to accomplish. I walked over to my wife and I set that book in her lap and I said, Lori, I said, read this. She read that and she looked at me and she said, don't even think about it. Because <laughs> it's not going to happen. Wouldn't you know, several weeks later, February 19th, 1995, I found myself laying on my back, the thermometer on my jacket buried at 30 below zero. The northern lights cascading green above me like a waterfall. The Iditarod Trail, Alaska.